All right, guys, good morning, good evening, whatever time of day it is for you. Hello, this is Coach Butler. The more I thought about the step loading video that I said I was going to post on Christmas, which I was a little bit late for, you guys from YouTube are just saying this now, but the more I thought about it, the more I thought it would be so much more valuable to the average viewer on here to not only understand step loading, but just also understand what I think about when I make a program. I guess you could say this is a part two to my Berserk Method video, the exact processes and thoughts that I have when I make client training programs. This is going to be a little more specific to actually making a program. A lot of general principles were covered in my first self-coaching video and a lot of mindset stuff, but in terms of format, things that I think about with specific exercise selection, and then even modifying an existing program, we're going to cover that today. Going to try not to take too much of your time, but there's a a few key areas of interest that I want to focus in on today. The first and foremost is going to be just examining this program that I have in front of you now. So this, if you haven't realized it already, is the free version of the conviction program that I have on Patreon. You can go ahead, sign in on there, leave a $5 donation at a minimum. It's a full 18-week macro cycle. goes through four training blocks and a desensitization period so that you can rerun the training program. This is the four-week version of it that I posted for free just to give you a general idea of what the split would look like. It's an awesome program, guys. It covers you from head to toe for squatting, overhead press, bench press, and also build your posterior chain through my favorite assistance exercise for the deadlift, which is the SLDL and or Romanian deadlift. And that's from a deficit with bands, without bands, whatever. Just to talk about what went into this program, and then we'll talk about how to change it for you. If you think about how to apply certain things that we're going to talk about today. And then also how to fit step loading in this program, because this isn't something that we I really use in this program. It's not to say that one is better than the other. It's just how I chose to wrote this program in particular. First and foremost, every program is going to start with main exercises. No duh. So the main exercises in a squat, bench, and overhead press program are going to be squat, bench, and overhead press variations. So first and foremost, the 30-degree incline bench. I posted an entire lecture on this exercise in of itself, which I will link down below. That opens up this particular rendition of the program. Now, There's a bit of nuance to that, so we'll cover this movement by movement for the most part, just to talk about substitutions that you guys can think about depending upon your leverages, your current setup, so on and so forth. The 30 degree incline is a generally good exercise to put in this slot, mainly for the following reasons. One, it's a bigger range of motion than a flat bench press. Two, it's less loading. It's a degree less loading than a flat bench press. And three, Since it's at an incline, it has more carryover to a flat bench press with the same grip width than a flat bench press would. Because it's at an incline, it's closer to that vertical angle that you're going to get in an overhead press. There's a reason why you may put another exercise here, though. So if you're someone where, actually, like myself, you have pretty long arms, when you go through a below parallel range of motion, when you compare the angle of your upper arm in relation to the plane of the bench, a high incline bench can actually be just as valuable, if not more valuable, because all the things that apply here also apply to the high incline bench. There's another added piece to that, though. Since the range of motion on a high incline bench is so much longer, Something really cool is going to happen. It's going to start to train something called mid-range mobility, stability, and strength. In a bench press, that essentially means the longer your range of motion are, the longer your range of motion is, the more stable you have to be throughout that range of motion, and the more power you have to generate throughout the strength curve. So an example of that could be something like a, a football bar bench for the same reason. In that instance, just the implement in of itself is unstable, so you have to maintain stability with this unstable implement over a big range of motion. Incline bench is kind of the same thing. So it's a big range of motion. You have to train to be explosive, strong, powerful, and contract these muscles through a larger range of motion. That's going to be very key for strength development. So 
And lifters like myself, um, a few clients I have, even in terms of people that you may have heard on uh, about on YouTube, Brendan Teat, someone that I um, I talk about and praise pretty regularly, he said uh, along the same lines of what he's noticed with the inc- high incline bench. He said recently, I believe, that his best bench press numbers, him being a moderate grip with, long arm bench presser, he got that when he was including things like high incline pl- press, overhead press, things that put your muscles through a larger range of motion. For that reason, that's something that you may substitute here. However, if you're someone with a more moderate you know, arm length and you're more parallel or above parallel, 30 degree incline bench is going to be a better option for you because quite honestly, if your arms are especially short, increasing the range of motion uh, an extra inch or two isn't just going to uh, do the same thing that it would for someone who already has longer arms. You see what I mean? Now, in terms of the cable external rotation, that's something that I include in every pressing program. If it has pressing in it and we're going to be uh, driving volume and intensity with that pressing, we're going to have some sort of rotator cuff work in there. That's just for the simple fact of as you're pushing certain exercises that involve pushing, you're going to also tax your rotator cuffs at an equivalent level. So rotator cuffs in and themselves are very durable. They're very volume resistant. They have to be because your shoulder is always moving in every which direction. It's just that they're a muscle that when they're overtaxed, they're overtaxed. It's not like a... uh, your quad or a hamstring even where, you know, you can overtrain one of those muscles and it won't be a big problem. But a a rotator cuff is kind of like one of those muscles where, you know, when it's had enough, it's had enough. You want to strengthen these things and make sure that you're getting blood shuttled into those areas. It's called localized blood flow. It's a galaxy brain term for saying, get a pump in that area. It's really good for your rotator cuff, not only to give it the localized blood flow, but also to strengthen over time. This is something to where when I put this on my um, clients' training programs, if they're not actually putting their weight here, I don't have them record it so they they can show it to me because, quite honestly, no one's trying to do that. I'm not trying to watch you do cable external rotation, but if I notice that you're consistently not either inputting it or the weight's staying the same or the reps are staying the same, it's going to be a conversation that we're going to have because you need to take stuff like this just as seriously as your heavier weight training. Now, in terms of the antagonist warm-up, what does that entail? Antagonist means opposite to whatever the agonist muscle is. So the agonist muscle that we're using in a pressing workout is going to be the pressing muscles. The antagonist muscles are your rear delts, upper back, lats, so on and so forth. Antagonist warm-ups for me, the way I like to program them, it's not only lightweight rowing with like a cable row or a chest support row or something like that, where you're not taxing your lower back. It's not very heavy on your lats, your upper back and all that musculature. It's just there by mechanism to give you just like with the external rotation, a pump. Basically that pump is really good for activating your muscles, raising your core body temperature and just getting your muscles ready to do what they're going to do on their pressing. So antagonist muscles on presses are used to stabilize your press. The more active and warmed up they are, the better they're going to do their job. That's things like your upper back, your scaps, your rear delts, your lats, things like that. What's included in that as well are lightweight dumbbell presses. So you get a lightweight dumbbell. So it's a 20-pound dumbbell or like a, a 10-kilogram dumbbell or something like that. And you do a couple sets of 25 with it. You could even take, if uh, you're especially strong, so if you bench 300, 350 pounds, you could take what is it, the 45-pound dumbbells, and do another set of 10 to 15 just to get a really good pump going to get those muscles ready to do what they need to do. I especially recommend this for guys that have, well, really everyone in general, but especially guys that have longer arms because you're just in general already going through a longer range of motion. You're going to want to make sure your pecs, your pec minor, your shoulders, your tries, they're, they're waked up, they're woken up, and they're ready to do what they need to do. Now, in terms of the chest supported row machine, now this is something that is a point of contention for a lot of people. So, so far we've covered things that just in general, no matter what the training program is, not even talking about any other periodization, these are things that are included or should be included in absolutely every training program that you write for yourself, no matter what, no matter what you're trying to train. So this honestly, this press could be 
interchanged with like a weighted dip or whatever main press you're doing. We're just talking about specific to conviction right now. But the chest supported row is something that's somewhat of a contested topic in strength and conditioning because you have one camp that says uh, freestanding barbell rows, Dan Green style, are the best for everyone to use because they they allow you to use the most weight, they recruit the most muscles, so on and so forth. And then there's the camp that says, look, we can get just as good of a bodybuilding effect from a chest supported row without all the extra fatigue on our lower back. And then there's the group that says, outside of those factors, uh, a newer entry level lifter, which is more than likely going to be uh, a good percentage of the people watching this video, they're people that don't necessarily have the body awareness to keep their back extended in a row to do it safely. I kind of agree with all of those things, but in terms of a best practice, getting the most bang for your buck, if what you're trying to do with your row is just build the support musculature that you're using in your press or in your squats, we have exercises like the stiff leg deadlift, the Romanian deadlift, and the back extension, which we'll talk about later, that build your spinal erectors, your mid and upper back, your hamstrings, your glutes, in a way that preferentially builds them and not, um, what's the word I'm looking for, passively work them like in a row to the point where like, okay, if you have a little bit of form breakdown on a stiff legged deadlift, it's not a dynamic movement like the row ends up being a lot of the time. So it ends up not being as safe for someone that's newer to lifting. I think that for people, especially that are stronger, Outside of that, because you have good form, a chest-supported row is going to be better just for the sheer fact of when you're stronger, the amount of volume that you can do on this, this, and this is often limited by the amount of volume that your lower back can recover from. If you're taking from those resources with your rows, which you're really using to support your your, your pressing and, and your squats, it's kind of like... Uh, trying to have your cake and eat it too. You're just overextending yourself. So a chest supported row where you're building all those things without your lower back is going to allow you to push your upper back musculature better, longer, and quite honestly, more efficiently, but it's just going to stop you from dipping into your lower body training. My philosophy is if your upper body training is taking away from your lower body volume, there's a problem with your exercise selection. And this is kind of where my philosophy lies with that. Last thing that I feel like should be included in every training program, regardless of what your goal with it is, is a weighted ab exercise. Here I put weighted ab exercise of choice. It's a training template. I really just want people to fill in here whatever they have access to. So you have access to a GHD, glute ham device. You can do GHD sit-ups. You can do uh, sit-ups if you have a dumbbell rack with the, the dumbbell in your uh you know, close to your neck, like in a front rack position. You can do weighted crunches if you don't have any of that stuff. The reason why I tend to include weighted ab exercises in everyone's training programs, regardless of what their goals are, is that abs and ab training, it's a two-sided approach. There's ab strength and there's ab function. Ab function is your ability to use your abs when you brace when you dynamically contract muscles in your lower back, when you're squatting, when you're bench pressing, to keep things stable and to keep things as strong as they can be. The more powerful your muscles are, however, the more functional they can potentially be. So it's the, just, it's the difference between this. So you have lifter A that can bicep curl 50 pounds for a one rep max, and then you have lifter B that can bicep curl 130 pounds for a one rep max, Whose biceps do you think are going to be more functional in a compound movement like a weighted pull-up? It's going to be the guy with the stronger biceps because they can contribute more to the lift because they are stronger. The function is the same in a bicep. You just extend your elbow and that's what and, and you um you curl it in. That's like the, the extent of your function with a bicep. It's just that the stronger that a muscle is, the more it can function. Same thing with your pecs, same thing with every muscle in your body. A lot of people lose sight of that when it comes to abs because it's just looked as like a show muscle, an aesthetic muscle. It's just as much a muscle as for performance that it is for show, if not more. So that's why we always have weighted ab exercises. I put that on every training day.
You see, it's a weighted ab exercise of choice on every training day. Now, every training day, this is going to be something different. Now, in terms of what you would want to specifically put here, again, it's just going to be dependent upon your strength level. So a good, just catch-all variation to put in here for you guys that are building your own training programs. Again, this is how to build a training program, taking you through step through step, and then we're going to talk about step loading. Good variation to put here is anything where, like if you have a dumbbell rack, a back extension, a GHD, do a weighted setup on that. The reason being is that, that it's very easily scalable. If you can only do five pounds, it allows you to just do five pounds. If you can do 100 pounds for reps like I can, you can do 100 pounds for reps. And it allows you to easily progressively overload over time. It's kind of like anything that you can add weight to is going to be the best options. That's the reason why barbells continue to be used the longer exercise uh, science continues to be studied. Because it's the best implement and the easiest implement to use to employ those things. Now, if you're someone that is on the stronger side, you could do stuff like front levers. You can do weighted leg raises. You can do regular leg raises. You can do tempo leg raises. You can do windshield wiper leg raises. The reason why I don't just prescribe those things on their own, there's dragonflies too. The reason why I don't prescribe those things on their own is because they have a larger, larger barrier of entry. So that's like prescribing to someone who is a newer lifter and you tell them to do one arm pull-ups for their, uh, <laughs> their back exercise. They're not going to be able to do that because they're not strong enough. Now, if you're someone that is more in the the sphere of uh, field athletics, so you're not a strength athlete necessarily, but you do play a sport, you're going to want to also include in here things that train your uh, your trunk from every angle. So that's where you'd put like your rotational exercises. That's something I actually just include in this program so that you can cover all your bases. You want to include things for your obliques, one, because just as a function, again, the stronger your obliques are, the tighter of a brace that you can get on something like a weightlifting belt. It also stops you from being rotated in, uh, you know, like the 90 degree plane. So that anti-rotational strength that you hear people talk about in your strength and conditioning, that gets built up when your obliques get built up. Good exercise for that. I call it the wood chopper. So you get on a landmine. You get, again, whatever plate selection that you need to be adequate for the training stimulus that you're at, and you just get to town. You chop wood, keep your arms straight, extended. You resist that rotational force coming down, and then you reverse it. That's excellent. That's actually something that I prescribe pretty often. Very common in strength and conditioning programs, any good strength and conditioning program anyway. That's essentially what like a good upper body day would look like. So some kind of press, and then we talked about a variation that you could put here, in, for instance. Some kind of rotator cuff work, some kind of antagonist warm-up to get you ready, some type of sep chest-supported row, and then some type of ab work. Anything outside of this is just to adjunct this. So in this particular program, it's an overhead press program. The primary work of the day is the bench. The secondary work of the day is the press. Seated press. We could talk about this really quickly before we talk about the um, the squat days. So the seated press is really good for developing overhead strength. I found, especially recently in my quest to uh, overhead press 120 kilos at uh, under 180 pounds body weight, um, because it removes every element of pressing that doesn't have to do with your upper body. And then it exaggerates the involvement of your core so it removes things like your hips your glutes your lower back your quads everything in your lower body that contributes to a stronger strict press gets removed in a seated strict press because you're you're sitting down now the reason why i like seated press better than z press which you could honestly use here as well is that it doesn't require any hamstring or hip mobility a lot of times with the Z press, a lot of people just aren't capable of doing it, not because of their lack of upper body strength, but because they just simply aren't mobile enough to sit down, spread eagle, and then do an overhead press. They'll fall over. They're just not mobile enough to do it. Seated press gives you all the same benefits, but just not the mobility prerequisites. Now, if you were to do anything to adjunct 
your main work of the day. There's two routes that you could go with it. So you can be purely bench focused, in which case this would just be a primary bench day, or you can try to train two uh, training goals, one auxiliary to the main goal that have carry over to one another. So in this case, the conceptualization of the conviction program is that we're using overhead press variations and bench press variations that all have carry over to one another. So as you get stronger at this, this one prove and vice versa and vice versa and vice versa. If you wanted to make it a pure bench pressing day, what you would do is instead of doing a bench press or a press variation, you would do a bench variation. Now you're like, no, duh, it's a bench day. I'm just going to pick another bench variation. You want to think about something called a gradient of loading. What that means, it's a very big brain way of saying that your exercises have to have tiers in terms of how much weight you use on them. So your main press is going to use the most weight. Your secondary press is going to use the second most weight, so on and so on. It's kind of uh, built in and intrinsic when you're doing a press slash bench program because your main press, in this case, is going to be your medium grip, slight incline bench press. And then you're immediately gradienting down to an exercise that has you using less weight, seated overhead press. Here's where things start to get interesting when you add that third press. So we talked about quickly the the auxiliary, the, the secondary press. Third presses. Now, this doesn't necessarily have to be less weight than your secondary press. It can be if that's what you want to do it. However, if you wanted to use, in this case, where you're mixing multiple things, so a press and an overhead uh, bench and an overhead press, you just want to make sure that this third press uses less weight than this one. This is why we have a floor press here. So floor presses, especially when you're using a bigger range of motion and you're, you're, you're pausing and things like that and you use reps and reserve to keep the loading down, is going to be lower than whatever you're using here where you're doing a top set to two reps and reserve. That's an RPE 8, a bunch of back down sets, and then some overhead pressing. The load is automatically going to be lower here. This is actually why I like using instead of like a percentage prescription where you're just using the same amount of weight no matter how you're, you're feeling or no matter how fatigued you are in the midst of your workout. Because in of itself, if you have four reps in reserve and you're fatigued, that's going to be very different than four reps in reserve and you doing this first. So the, the load's just going to be lower automatically. It's a good way to program a third press. It's what I prefer to do. Now, the last thing in terms of assistance and accessory exercises specific to conviction, you want to think about uh, icing on the cake. So just like with um, the rotator cuff exercises, there are muscles that are used in presses and overhead presses, bench presses, anything where you're pushing with your upper body that are passive. They're like support muscles. Your rear delts are really important for that and triceps in particular instances. On the Berserk Method self-coaching video, the first video that we released as part of this series, we talked about the need for tricep work is dependent upon your leverages for the bench press, overhead press, whatever. The longer your arms are, the less you need it, especially the more pure pressing volume that you're doing. I myself have noticed that if I am maximizing the amount of exercises that I can do for my bench or overhead press, adding in any additional tricep work on top of that just starts to accumulate things like elbow pain, tricep tendonitis, things like that. Because when you look at what your arm does when it's long on a bench press, you can fully extend your arm for, through its full range of motion on pretty much any press variation you're doing, even if it's not close grip. If your arms are shorter, this is where you include things like your tricep push down, so on and so forth. But the rear delt work is especially valuable, but it's not necessary, especially if you're already doing like a chest supported row machine, because those get worked on chest supported rows as well. Just in general, I made a Q&A video. This is transitioning into um, our next part of the lecture. I made a video talking about the pillars of any good strength and conditioning program. Now, when you or building your strength and conditioning program, you want to think about biggest bang for your buck and main movements, pillars. 
I said that some sort of press, some sort of squat, and then some sort of pull, whether it be rows or pull-ups, are the main pillars of any good strength and conditioning program. Nothing builds your upper body like a bench press or an overhead press. Nothing builds your lower body explosiveness, strength, stability like a squat. And nothing builds your support musculature and just your overall capacity for strength like a row or a nice pull-up or something like that. All of those are featured in this program. All of those will be featured in any good strength and conditioning program. Any mediocre strength and conditioning program will include those in absence of anything else. Now just to talk about a good squat day, things that I include at a minimum. Again, movement prep. Movement prep is absolutely necessary for you to be able to just, one, increase your training outcomes in terms of your muscles performance, but two, just to keep you safe. Just like with uh, the, the, the pressing, you want to get your muscles warm, pumped, ready to do what they're ready, what they need to do. So for me, one that I particularly like, one that I include on every strength and conditioning program is stationary bike. And the reason for that is, is that a stationary bike is the only exercise I can think of that would allow you to go through thousands of reps of knee flexion and knee extension with a decent amount of weight that's going to give you a pump through your legs, through your hips, through your calves, through your whole lower body without fatiguing you. So five to 10 minutes on a stationary bike is going to get everything very vascular, very um, pumped from your patellar tendon to your meniscus, to your quad tendon, to everything in your calves, to your hamstrings, to your hips. Everything's going to get a nice pump. It's, it's a no brainer. If you're not including it, this is something that you can start including today to make your squat workouts just more productive, especially if you're someone that's having knee pain or anything uh, deleterious in any of your lower body musculature. Stationary bike is the way to go. Then you have things like lightweight squats with the, with the bar, with like whatever implement that you're about to use. So in conviction, in my mind, if you're running this, you're using a safety bar squat. Um, the reason being is that just... High bar squats aren't terribly fatiguing on your shoulders compared to low bar squats, which is why we don't use those here, just because of the positioning differences. But they still do come with an element of rotator cuff fatigue that you just don't get on a safety bar squat. So that's why here we put either or, but really in my mind on a good strength and conditioning program, the safety bar squat is going to get used uh, in favor of the high bar squat, especially when you're pushing pressing. Now, that's just going to be dependent upon the athlete. So if like you're a weightlifter, for, exist, uh, for example, you're not going to use a safety bar. You're going to use the barbell because that's specific to what you're doing. And you're just not doing as much pressing as, say, a power lifter would or a bodybuilder or something like that or a field athlete. You're just not doing as much pressing in general. In any way, you have to be good specifically at squatting with a barbell because that is a skill in of itself that you won't develop using a safety bar just because they're two different implements. Obviously, we have our movement prep. We have our squat. What else is just I must have this in a good squat day? We're going to have some sort of pulling. So the reason for that is, is that in a squat, when you're developing your lower body, uh, a big part of what keeps your stability Stability starts from the neck down on a squat. So there are a lot of things that can go wrong on a squat. And that can point to individual spots in your setup or where your muscular weaknesses are that cause things like hip shift, knee cave, uneven foot pressure, things like that. It starts at the shoulders, okay? So we're going to talk from the shoulders and go down just to talk about the lat pull down or the pull up really quick. With your shoulders, if you have a especially uneven amount of external rotation on one arm versus the other, it's going to cause the bar to get pulled down on one side more than the other or pulled laterally front and back more than one or the other. What that's going to cause is an instability that goes down into your bracing, into your core, which then goes into your hips, into your knees, and into your feet. You see what I mean about how instability starts from the top down? So a, a strong upper back in absence of something like mobility and e equality in either arm is going to allow you to be the most stable that you can be in an already unstable setup. Obviously, you would want to do things like your external rotation pulls just to equalize the amount of um, mobility between your, your, your arms as possible. But a lap pull down is part of that 
um, specific prescription as well. Mainly because when you look at what someone does on a really good squat, they're pulling down. And look at the way that your elbows and your arms are oriented on a lat pull down or a pull up versus something like a uh, a row, for instance. It's the exact same motion that you're going to be doing on a squat. So with a squat, you're pulling the bar over your back like uh, like Bane when he broke Batman's back over his neck. That's exactly what you're doing to the bar. You're trying to do anyway. Some kind of pull up or pull down. Not only that, but it's also giving assistance volume to raise your capacity for your bench, for your other rowing motions. Everything bleeds in synergistically with one another. On top of that, any good squat program is going to have some sort of accessory squat volume. You can't get all your volume from squats, guys. Uh, assistance volume for squats isn't a... Uh, it isn't like a it isn't a negotiable aspect of your squat training program for 99% of people unless like you're someone that like you're genuinely built for squats in which case it would still behoove you to do squat assistance volume just to prevent things like overuse i really like fully atg volume that's you're going through your full knee extension you're going through your full hip flexion your full hip extension you're using the biggest range of motion that your lower body muscles can. And this develops you from a bodybuilding standpoint. Now, not like a aesthetic standpoint, but just from a maximal hypertrophy standpoint. It's allowing you to raise your ceiling in that regard so that you can express more strength on your things like your SSB squats, your high bar squats. Now, just to double back on this real quick, with your bigger lower body movements for squat particularly, what you're looking for when you're trying to develop maximal strength is to use an optimal joint angle. Now, it, it sounds like some Joel Seedman, uh, uh, like a Joel Seedman talking point where he talks about the 90 degree joint angle and things like that. I'm not telling you to quarter squat, but a parallel squat or whatever squat that you're using that allows you to use the most weight possible is just going to develop your body differently than even a... Um, a fully, you know, a fully ass to grass variation. So the reason for that being is that you're being actually loaded with a, a much larger weight, more than likely relative to your full range of motion squat. And that's just going to make you more explosive in of itself. It's going to make the support musculature stronger that you're using. It's going to do things like raise your ceiling on your stiff leg deadlifts and your other lower body exercises because your lower body is just stronger in general. That's why I differentiate between parallel here and fully ATG here. It's just the best way to do it. So you raise your performance here, and then you raise your hypertrophy here. Now, again, weighted ab exercises. That is, again, mandatory every day. Some sort of hip hinge. I really like stiff-legged deadlifts and Romanian deadlifts as opposed to conventional or sumo deadlifts. One just because they use a larger range of motion on everything used in a conventional deadlift, so it trains it on its own. It's what I call a self-limiting variation on the Berserk method, uh, the self-coaching video. That's the first thing. Now, the second thing is that it also allows you to use less weight than uh, conventional or sumo deadlift, especially a sumo deadlift if you're really good at them. That's really good if you're someone that is just trying to develop overall general strength and not necessarily maximal strength with like the heaviest lift that you can do. Now, this program is focused on squats. Squats are a better developmental tool than deadlifts. They quite honestly will make you stronger, easier than deadlifts. And when you're focusing on squat, it would behoove you to be of more resources to that than you are your deadlift. A conventional deadlift here would just take away from this, this, you're pressing muscles even on your next bench day. Like the juice isn't worth the squeeze if what you're trying to improve is your squat maximally and your presses maximally. That's why, just in general, unless someone is specifically prepping for a powerlifting competition or strongman or something like that, they're going to be doing some sort of hip hinge variation, like a stiff legged deadlift or an RDL. It's just a better exercise overall for what you're trying to do. What you're trying to do with this here is just build the strength and stability of your hip extensors 
and your lower back through as big of a range of motion as possible. Those are a no-brainer here. Now, we talked about what goes into a good pressing day. And this is time stamped, so you can go back and watch that. We're going to be addressing specific periodization in terms of how to include step loading. This is the second part of the lecture. With step loading, the, the way that that was conceptualized, I forget what country um, first started using it, but just to briefly talk about what's done in most Western periodization models is that it's always a more, more is more kind of thing. So we're thinking more load means better stimulus, which means better strength over time, which means you, if you have better strength, you can do more weight on your, like your back down, so on and so forth. That's not tenable long term. What's more tenable long term is you is taking a lift that you can lift comfortably with several reps in reserve and doing an ascending level of volume with it. So what it'll look like week one on a good step loading model. You'll do three sets of 10. This is just like the most basic step loading that you could do. You can do three sets of 10 on your main press. This is mostly going to be used for main pressing exercises, main squatting exercises, so on and so forth. Not necessarily used as much on your assistance exercises, just because you should push those harder just in general. But what you're trying to actually build that you're going to be doing year round and not rotating very much, if at all, you need to do in a more long term tenable fashion. You look at a lot of a lot of the studies surrounding hypertrophy and strength training. You'll find that it's very commonly accepted that you do not need to train to failure to elicit strength growth or hypertrophy. You just need to train within a relevant range of that. Some people have found that that's five reps in reserve, four reps in reserve. The key is is that you're not going to failure in each exercise, and if you wanted to, you could have done multiple more uh, additional reps with the set. That is the base idea of step loading. It's this understanding that you just don't need to bury yourself so deep into the mud each training session to get a training response. It's all about setting that base level of strength, right? That base level of volume, the base level of performance. If you take three sets of 10, that's a 100% volume increase over you doing no sets of 10, right? So that's your baseline. If you then go from three sets of 10 to four sets of 10, that's another additional 10 reps. So let's just say that you're using 250 pounds as a bench press. 250 times 10 is 2,500. That's 2,500 pounds of extra tonnage versus if you were to have just used 255 pounds, you get 10 on your first set, then you get nine on your second set, but it's a grinder, and then you get seven on your third set. The tonnage is far lower and far harder to accumulate because you're using a higher intensity just versus using something of a lower intensity, say 240 pounds, for working up to five sets of 10. This is going to be really good for accumulating volume on your main movements. As you increase in volume, that's a little training adaptation that you're stacking up over time. The key tenet of step loading or step progression is to accumulate these small progressions over time Coming to the gym knowing that you can absolutely finish every single rep, so you're, it's mindless work. It's very smooth rep, rep work that accumulates to a higher ceiling over time. You can use a sub-maximal approach, and if you keep things within a few reps in reserve and just progress that over time, keeping a few reps in reserve over time, you'll find that, hey, week one, you were doing sets of 240 for 10. And then 16 weeks from then, you're doing 275 for sets of 10 at the same exertion without ever pushing yourself on that exercise. Push yourself on things like your assistance exercises to help raise your ceiling for your main exercise. But for your main exercises, you don't really ever have to go to failure unless you're testing something. Now, in terms of how you would progress that here, right here, we're using my, um, my progression model that I like to use for most people. I don't have a name for it or anything like that. You can just call it the, the Omni Progression Model, if that's what you wanted to call it. It's a top set that is based on RPE or reps in reserve that's a decent exertion, but still with a couple reps in reserve. And then you have percentage back downs based off of that. It essentially does the same thing that step loading does, except for this is more, I guess you could say, intensity driven. So 
we're adding a little weight, but still keeping things sub-maximal on our back downs. And then after so many weeks of accumulating sets over time, we're doing a top set of five or four or whatever it is. So it kind of is step loading in the sense that like we're adding over time more sets of this more intense back down work before we do like a testing phase. But it's different in that like the overall tonnage isn't changing very much. Just the intensity of each individual set. This is really awesome for progression. I use it myself currently for most of my exercises. But if we wanted to do step loading, here's what we could do. So we have our top set of two at two reps in reserve. What we're going to do, we can actually keep this the same. Now, as opposed to you doing two reps in reserve, we're going to do three reps in reserve. A set of five at three reps in reserve is going to be something that you could do a set of eight with if you had your, you know, gun pointed to your head, okay? Like, do three more reps. That's about 80% of your one rep max. You can do three sets of this at three reps in reserve. And we're going to get rid of these two here. You can do three sets of that at three reps in reserve, and your last set is certainly going to be harder than your first one, but you're going to be able to complete all three sets with at least one rep in reserve, right? Now, as you go on to week two, this set, these uh, three sets of five will turn into four sets of five, and then five sets of five will turn into, you know, four sets of five will turn into five sets of five. After you get to five sets of five, it's not a testing phase that you do, unlike, you know, the omni progression model that I use on conviction in a lot of my programs, you're changing to a different rep range. So this uh, five sets of five turns into three sets of three at three reps in reserve. Three sets of three at three reps in reserve is something that you could do a set of six with. That's going to be something like 85% of your one rep max. You see what I'm saying? At this point, you're just doing the same thing. So three sets of three goes to three, four sets of three goes to five sets of three. And then you could go to doubles or you could go to singles. And then you could have a, a block of when you're, you're, you're testing like a maximal attempt. I do recommend with step loading that you start higher with reps than lower with reps. That just happened to be what I had typed in already in the program. I'm going to recommend with step loading in particular that you start with three sets of 12. Three sets of 12 turns into five sets of 12, and then when you need to graduate down, you go to three sets of eight, you go to five sets of eight, and then you can go three or five. So 12s, eights, and then fives is what you're going to want to do. Now, what you'll find is, is that progression once you go through you, and you cycle through all these steps, that's why it's called step loading. So let's say you end up at your five sets of five. You started at three sets of 12. You ended up at five sets of uh, five sets of five. Once you go back to these three sets of 12, you're going to find that you can use more weight on your first week than you could when you first did your three sets of 12 four weeks ago. And that's kind of where the progression with it comes. You're accumulating volume, you're gaining strength, you're gaining work capacity, and then you're deloading. You're going back to a lighter percentage because 12s are lighter than fives. And then you're just cycling the whole submaximal approach over and over and over and over again. It's never really difficult per se until you get to your weeks where you're doing five sets of something you see what i mean like five sets of 12 that's a lot of volume that's 60 total repetitions that's going to build a heck of a lot of capacity for when you go to your eights and you're doing three sets of eight that's going to make this feel like a joke you see what i mean and then when you get to your five sets of eight, you'll have the ability to easily do 40 repetitions because you just did 60. You see what I mean? And then when you go to five sets of five, it's now 25. The cool thing with this is that you're training your work capacity on the first steps and you're also at the same time desensitizing yourself to very high rep work. That makes you very 
inclined to get a good training stimulus by the time you go back to 12s again. So it's a fresh training stimulus. That is the beauty of step progression. You can do this really on everything in the conviction program. Everything where I use the omni progression, you could just as easily put in step progression like I just explained and get similar results. Here's one final word when it comes to a good training program. A lot of this stuff works, guys. It's all tools in the toolbox. It's all about what works best for the athlete, what works best for you. You find something that works, and you stick to it. A program that worked for you very well the first time is going to work for you very well again and again and again and again. When you need to change something, you change things one variable at a time. I've, cha- I've spoken to that numerous times on my channel, you change one thing at a time. So where this might be, you can get away with doing step loading with three reps in reserve. As you get stronger, you may need to start it with uh, four reps in reserve. And and instead of starting off with three sets, you need more volume because you're stronger and you're doing four sets. And then instead of necessarily increasing in sets right away, then you increase in your exertion with these sets, and then you do five sets of 12 the the week after that. So you start at four reps in reserve, you go to three, and then you add an extra set with your three reps in reserve, and then that can be your step loading. It's very customizable and very free-flowing step progression and step loading. There's basically three different ways that you can step load or step progress. You can add a set, which is the variation of it I'd recommend that most of you do. You can add a rep or you can step progress RPE. Step progressing RPE just means you're using more exertion than you did the previous week. I use that still on most of my programs just because in that in of itself just raises raises average intensity, which does a whole lot for your strength if that's what you're trying to develop. But those other two things are more so increasing tonnage. For you bodybuilders, you guys that are just mainly concerned with hypertrophy, step loading is going to be the way to go for you. Like I said, it allows you to get in quality tonnage. It's not going to beat you into the ground. It's going to prevent the need for things like deloads for a longer amount of time because the work that you're doing is more submaximal than what you're probably doing now. And that's how you make a training program, guys. That's how you customize it based on your needs. This is how you include step loading into your programs and also what step loading is and how you can do that in different ways. If you have any questions, this is from my strength and conditioning course that I've been putting together for the better part of a, I guess, a year now, actually. This is just a taste of the information that you get in that accredited course. It's going to be a course that when you go through it, it's nine modules long, goes through everything from prehab, rehab, movement prep, lifter psychology, athlete psychology, how to run a business, periodization from head to toe. This is just the tip of the iceberg of what I can teach you in terms of training programming, training and strength and conditioning. If you're interested in that, you can shoot me an email to my business email. I'll put your name on the release list something that I'm still working on. It's an ongoing process, but I will send you updates if you give me your email and we'll make sure that course gets out to you. If you have any questions about this lecture, please leave them down below. This will be fully timestamped for you to look at particular areas of interest. However, I do recommend that you watch the entire thing just because you have to understand each aspect of writing a good program to write a good program. So don't skip around. I'll see y'all guys in the next one. Peace.